Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you all to the first lecture of the 2018 Everhart Lecture Series. My name is Kelly Mauser, and I'm the chair of the Everhart Committee. The Everhart Lecture Series is a program funded by the Graduate Office and supported by the Graduate Student Council. It is a forum which encourages interdisciplinary interactions among students and faculty and recognizes the exemplary presentation and research abilities of Caltech's graduate students. Each year, an interdisciplinary committee of fellow graduate students selects three lecturers based on their dynamic speaking skills, their ability to communicate the broader importance of their research, and the impact of their work on the scientific community. As you all know, Caltech has an abundance of outstanding graduate students with all of these qualities, and choosing just three from this year's candidates was not an easy task. The first of this truly exceptional group is Max Easy from the Department of Physics. At this point, I would like to ask Professor Alan Weinstein to come up and introduce Max. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Max Issy, who's a, a, a fourth year grad student in Caltech, uh, working under, uh, in, in my group. Um, Max comes from Uruguay, uh, which I think is somewhere south of Brazil. He's, he's nodding his head. Um, and um, uh, he was lured to Southern California uh, by Loyola Marymount University, uh, who, um, where he did his undergraduate degree. Uh, he managed to find uh, time uh, at, that, uh, at that institution to uh, do research and even publish several papers on interesting aspects of quantum gravity, quantum un, um, alternative gravity, uh, writing papers that I, as a physics professor, really just would have no hope of, of understanding. Um, but it seemed pretty impressive to me. So I managed to lure him across town to Caltech here uh, to um, uh, work on something far more prosaic and down to earth. Um, uh, as a, first as a surf in 2012, actually, uh, to work on studying or preparing for measuring the polarization of gravitational waves from, emitted from spinning neutron stars in our galaxy. Um, pretty down to earth as far as I can tell because you can actually do that sort of thing. We still have not detected, by the way, gravitational waves from uh, spinning neutron stars in our galaxy, so that's still in the future. Um, but I had been working on this problem for, for many years and it had involved many um, uh, uh, surf students and undergrads, Caltech undergrads, uh, on working on this problem, but really no one came close to Max um, in terms of uh, uh, really understanding what needed to be done and making tremendous progress and actually doing it. Uh, it was so terrific that I had him come back in 2013 for a second surf on the subject, and then I realized I could not live without him, and I <laughs> twisted his arm and forced him to come as a graduate student uh, to approximately, more or less, uh, continue that work and really be prepared for the first detections. And in fact, again, we still have not yet detected uh, gravitational waves from spinning neutron stars, but as probably most of you in the audience know, we have detected gravitational waves from, uh, from binary black holes in very distant galaxies. And um, when we did that, of course, we were happy to share that wisdom uh, and what we've learned um, with the world. And it turned out that Max was a, a phenomenal uh, emissary and, and, and um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, explainer of our science, especially in his home country. Uh, he probably talked to, I don't know, hundreds of people, um, all the way from you know, high schoolers up to professors, um, um, uh, people at all levels in Uruguay. And I don't um, uh, speak Spanish, so I can't understand what's happening in the, um, uh, in the videos, but I can certainly tell that um, he really turned these people on. And uh, that was, that was uh, I was very gratified by that. Hopefully he might do something like that uh, with you. But what I really wasn't prepared for was what he was able to do with the LIGO detections that we did make of binary black hole mergers in distant galaxies, where I sort of figured out ah, it's gonna be a little bit too hard to measure this kind of stuff. But in the end, what Max was able to do, and very quickly as well, is because he was so well prepared and so ready to jump on it, uh, is make the very first measurements of a fundamental property, of a fundamental phenomenon in nature. Now, physicists love the word fundamental. We use it all the time, okay? We bandy it about. But um, despite that fact, um, um, actually, um, it, it is, remains quite rare for anyone 
much less a graduate student, to make a fundamental measurement of a fundamental property of nature. And well, Max did it. And um, so I, I hope he can tell us uh, or explain to us exactly what he did and how he did it and why it's so very important. Max. Thank you, Alan. I can't live without you either. <laughs> So the story of LIGO is one that has been told multiple times on this campus, so I'll start on a more personal note. Because uh, on September 14, 2015, uh, um, I was actually in bed with the worst fever I had had in years. But like the good Caltech student that I am, I kept frantically checking my email for fear of missing out. And that's when I caught this message with like the odd title of very interesting event which was telling us about a very interesting event that had supposedly showed up in LIGO data. So this was all enough that I immediately jumped to my computer, emailed Alan to see if there was anything I could do uh, to help with this, and try to log into the Caltech computers and see if I could see the data and find out what this very interesting event was all about. But the fever got the best of me, and I failed. And then I accidentally deleted the email. And in the days later, when I was feeling better, I even thought this, it had all been just a weird fever dream. Except there had been also hundreds of other follow-up emails, so people freaking out trying to try to make sense of what had happened on that day. And that is how I found out that the Earth had shaken on that day. The Earth found out a few months later when we announced the first direct detection of gravitational waves. And this was a phenomenon predicted by Einstein 100 years before. And it was a remarkable, monumental achievement, so much so that even the public got excited about it. And you can see some of the covers of newspapers around the world announcing our discovery. Um, they, the public got excited, even if they didn't really know what there was to be excited about. But something important had happened. So the, my, my first goal with this talk will be to elucidate some of the importance, explain why this was so remarkable, and then move on to tell you a little bit about uh, what I do here at Caltech, trying to as Alan, tell you measure some of the fundamental properties of gravitational waves. But before we do that, I'll ask you to take a step back and think about your most fundamental intuitions about how space and time work. If you're anything like me, to use time is perhaps some sort of clock that ticks regularly for everyone and everywhere. It doesn't matter who or where you are. And space is perhaps some sort of three-dimensional Cartesian grid in which we can locate events as they ha uh, that happen at a given moment in time. But a hundred years of scientific development point us to a different picture, one in which actually space and time come together into a fabric of space-time which can curve in the presence of gravitational, uh, of, of mass or energy. And this curvature is what we experience as the force of gravity. So space-time is not it's not rigid. It can bend, it can squeeze, it can stretch. And it's no longer just a featureless stage on which the events, the history of the universe unfolds, but it's an active actor in, in, in this play. So space-time is dynamic. That's the fundamental message from Einstein's theory of general relativity. And the theory is, can be quite complicated. It's summarized in Einstein's um, Einstein's field equations, but the main message is just that space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve, which was eminently boiled down by, by the famous phys physicist John Wheeler. So we're left with a picture like this, in which we can explain the gravitational interaction between two bodies, say the sun and the earth, as the result of the curved space around them, which here is represented by the two-dimensional green grid that bends around the two objects. But for our purposes, the most interesting part or lesson to be drawn from this picture is that if this is just a static snapshot of, of, the, of this system. The Earth is, and the Sun are orbiting around each other. And as they do, this configuration of matter changes. And so the curvature of space and time around it must respond to that. And it can only do so at a finite speed. That's another basic law of physics. Nothing can, can propagate faster than the speed of light. And which, when you have a perturbation that can only move at a finite speed, you get waves. And this is just like an, um, when you drop a pebble in a pond or when you accelerate an electric charge and create uh, ripples in an ele electromagnetic field, which is light. 
except these waves are waves in the gravitational field. And there's a dual language that you can use to describe these things in terms of, um, in terms of the curvature of space and time or gravitational fields, and I will use either, so don't get confused. If, if you get confused by the notion of curved space time, just switch that in your head to, to gravity. So these gravitational waves are an actual physical effect, and as, as perturbations in the curvature of space and time, their effect is actually to literally stretch and squeeze distances. So you can imagine that a gravitational wave coming in into the screen will at some at one moment stretch me in the vertical direction and squeeze me in the horizontal direction, making me taller and thinner, while the next moment, a period later, it will do the opposite and compress me vertically and expand me horizontally, making me, making me fat and short. Another way to visualize that is that if you imagine you have a series of free-falling rings just out in space, um, and they form a cylinder, uh, if, you, if, if there was a wave propagating in the direction of the axis of the cylinder, then they, it would compress and stretch the, the rings in this form, so you would see something like this. So the effect of a gravitational wave is to stretch or compress distances in a way that's proportional to the distance that you start with. So if you imagine just grabbing one of those rings that I was just showing you, the gravitational wave will come in at one moment, deform it so it gets stretched in one direction and squeezed in the other. And so if you started with a distance with a, with a length that is L, say in this case the radius of the, of this, of the circle, and the gravitational wave would change that distance by an amount delta L which will be proportional to the length that you started with. And so we can define this quantity which gives you the amplitude of a given wave, which is the strain. So you'll hear me talking about the strain a lot in this talk. And that just tells you how, par how, how powerful, how strong the wave is. A strong wave will change a meter stick by say one centimeter, whereas a weaker wave will change it only by one millimeter or something like that. And that, that quantity, the strain, is what tells us what the amplitude of the wave is. So, so far so good, but this, begs the question, if any, basically any configura accelerated configuration of matter can produce these gravitational waves and the effect is something so obvious as literally stretching and squeezing distances, why don't we see them? Where are these gravitational waves? And the answer is everywhere, except they're extremely mind-bogglingly small. And to understand that, you, perhaps you can go back to the Einstein's equations and very naively, what they, are telling, what they can tell you is that the curvature of space-time, so how much space-time is curved in a given region with some concentration of matter, is proportional to the stress that is caused by that density of energy and, um, or matter in that region. But the proportionality constant is some extremely small number. So that tells you that you need to apply a lot of stress, a lot of force, you need a lot of energy even to curve space-time by a small amount. So sp space-time is very hard to bend. This is a very naive, um, way of understanding why these gravitational waves will always be so weak. But to maybe get a better feeling of what, of what this means, we can consider the canonical or preferred kind of system to our source of gravitational waves, which are binary systems. So it could be two skaters, two ice skaters holding hands, or it could be the sun and the earth, it could be the sun and the moon, or two black holes going around each other, it doesn't matter. So if you know math and you go back to Einstein's equations, they will tell you that the strain or the amplitude of a gravitational wave will be inversely proportional to your distance from the source, which is to be expected, that's what happens with sound or with um, light or whatever wave, the, the amplitude will decay the farther away you are from the source. It will be directly proportional to the two masses of the objects that are orbiting around each other, and it will be inversely proportional to the distance between them. So the closer the two objects are, the faster they move and the more gravitational waves they emit. There's a slightly more complicated relationship for the, the power that is emitted by the gravitational waves, uh, by, by the source, but um, the main message is that the more mass closer together, they move, move faster and will create more gravitational waves. So you can try to use these equations and plug in the numbers from some example system to get a feeling for what this actually means and say the, the Earth, uh, again, the sun and the Earth. For example, if I did the math correctly, which you should go and check because maybe I did it, probably did it wrong. But in any case, you would probably find out that the, the strain, so the amplitude of a gravitational wave, one light year away from the solar system is one part in 10 to, uh, 10 to 26. That means that distances will, will be changed by one part in 10 to 26. 
and the total emitted power by the Sun-Earth system will be something that is equivalent to like two light bulbs. And that maybe doesn't seem so small, but you have to keep in mind that this is the whole mass of the sun and all the whole mass of the earth behind this production mechanism cre creating these waves. And all they can do is just output a measly two light bulbs of, of power. Just for comparison, um, just the electromagnetic output, so the, the radiation and light from the sun is something like 10 to 26 watts, which is like one septillion light bulbs. There, there aren't one septillion light bulbs here because I can only copy and paste so many light bulbs, okay? But <laughs> the idea is, of this silly example, is that whatever the source is, there will be, gravitational waves will be very weak. And you will necessarily have to have an instrument that's extremely sensitive to be able to detect this, these very faint changes in distances as the waves um, go through the Earth. And that's, that's where we come in. So LIGO is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And it's an instrument designed to precisely detect the minute changes in length produced by these gravitational waves as they go through the Earth. As the name says, the, the key technology behind this instrument is interferometry. And so the idea is that <coughs> you will grab a laser beam and split it into two so that it travels down two perpendicular arms. And the, each of the beams will then bounce back from a mirror at the end of the arms. And they will recombine at the center where they originally got split. If the two arms are exactly, precisely the same length, then the faces of the light will work out such that no light comes out from this side um, of the instrument. However, if there's some mismatch in the length of the two arms, some light will escape and it will be, will be able to detect it with a photodiode, which we can then convert into an electric digital signal. And that way, when a gravitational wave comes in and changes, the distance, the relative distance, there's a mismatch between the distance of the, the length of the two arms, we'll be able to, to see that and record that. The, our actual in instruments are quite a bit more complicated than this. To begin with, the arms are each four kilometers long, so two miles and a half long. And what you see there are concrete tubes that protect, a uh, concrete enclosure that protects metal tubes that are kept at a vacuum of, I think, 10 to the negative 9 torr, which is one trillionth the atmosphere, the pressure of the atmosphere. And that's so the infrared light that we use can travel back and forth uh, almost without scattering. And, and I said instruments because there's two. There's the one in Hanford, in the deserts of Hanford, Washington, that you were just looking at. And there is a second twin instrument in um, the swamps of Louisiana, which you'll see in a second. Um, the two instruments, the two facilities, are designed to be precise clones to each other. And they share not only the very cutting edge technology uh, to make, the, let's say, the most, laser, the most stable laser probably in the world and extremely high vacuum, but also um, cutting edge uh, seismic isolation technologies and in particular, the extremely uh, precise, uh, beautiful, perfect optics. Uh, the mirrors, which are polished to, to nanometer levels, so basically atom by atom, so that they are as smooth as possible and they have all sorts of optical coatings and um, a lot of technology that escapes me. Um, but the idea is that these are the most, some of the most perfect mirrors for the kind of infrared light that we use, and they will absorb only one out of something like three million photons that uh, bounce off it. And they're, they're around this size, size and they're 40 kilograms each, so they're quite big, and these are placed at the end of the, of the arms and in different intermediate parts. Um, so this is an extremely complex machine with a lot of nuances that require the in development of new technologies and a lot of work. It's not only extremely precise, but it's also, it, it's also implemented at a scale that is very large for this kind of precise measurements, which is very challenging. So it's not surprising that it takes a lot of people to make something like this work. And this is a more or less recent picture of our, the LIGO laboratory group here at Caltech. But overall, there are around 1,000 people in eight, in eight institutions, 16 countries around the world, which contribute to the LIGO scientific collaboration, either by working on the instruments or the analysis of the data uh, that they produce. 
So it is thanks to all these people that we were ready on September 14th, 2015, when the LIGO instruments detected the faint rumble of the first gravitational waves to ever be detected, directly, I should say. And these gravitational waves originated at the very end of a cosmic dance that had lasted for millions of years as two black holes orbited each other emitting gravitational waves and finally crashing and, and producing a fantastic burst of gravitational waves that was more powerful than all of the stars of all the galaxies so in the whole visible universe combined. Luckily for us, we were quite far from such a cataclysmic uh, <laughs> event. Uh, the signal actually took 1.3 billion years to, to reach Earth. So when this signal was emitted, multicellular life was barely starting um, on the planet Earth. Then the dinosaurs came by, they, they went extinct uh, <laughs> 15,000 15, years uh, ago. The, when the signal was on the outskirts of the Milky Way galaxy, um, or Homo sapiens was just starting to take over um, the Neanderthals and stuff. And eventually, a hundred years ago, Einstein predicted these waves would exist. And then finally, on September 14th, 2015, the waves passed through the Earth just a uh, little after we had turned on our events, so we, uh, our instruments, so we could actually detect it. These, uh, all of this is not made up. We know it from the data that the instruments recorded. And so uh, the instruments recorded actually around 200, uh, one fifth of a second of signal. And from that, we can reconstruct this whole story that I told you about. And because the, um, so the instruments will dance, will dance to the beat of these long gone black holes. And in so doing, they will record the signal from the, using the photodiode. So it's an electric signal, which we can store as a digital file, and then we can convert to a sound. It so happens that the frequencies of the signal fall well within the hearing range uh, of humans. So I can actually play it for you if the gods of audiovisual work. So what I will show you now is the actual data recorded by our instruments. On the x-axis here, you see the, the time. So that as time progresses, the signal comes, goes through the Earth. And on the y-axis, there's the frequency of the signal, so the pitch. Um, and then you'll see color traces, which will in, or, or a map, a color map, which will indicate how powerful, so how much energy there is in the signal at, a, at that given time and frequency. Um, so, and of course, I should say the, the two panels correspond to the two instruments. Let's see if this works. You'll hear two versions of this uh, sound, one which is more authentic and the second one which has been pushed higher in pitch so you can hear it better. This uh, characteristic structure, which we call it chirp, as because it's whooping up in frequency and amplitude, um, it's actually a direct consequence of the dynamics of the system that produced this signal. As the two black holes came closer together, they emitted more gravitational waves, which caused them to become closer even together, and that makes them go faster, and so they emit more gravitational waves, and that's a runaway process that ends up with them crashing into each other and emitting this uh, whoop, this chirp of gravitational waves. So for you to have an idea of what this means, at this point of maximum amplitude of the signal, the strain that was associated with this gravitational wave, so if you remember the changing length over the length, was 10 to the negative 21. That means uh, that our, our instruments that have four kilometer arms changed in, this, in, in length, the mismatching length between the two arms was four times 10 to the negative 18 meters. This is an extremely small number. So for you to get an idea, a, the width of a human hair is on average 10 to the negative six meters, I think. So 10,000 smaller than that, 10 to the negative 10 meters is sort of the size of an atom. 10 to the negative 15 meters is the size of the nucleus of an atom. And so our, the mismatching length that we were able to measure was a thousand times smaller than the size of the nucleus of an atom. So that's why it took a thousand people and several decades to achieve the required level of precision to actually be able to measure this. Einstein himself and probably most people uh, 
throughout history thought this would never be possible. This was only the first detection of many, actually. Since then, we've seen several other black hole systems merging around the universe. We named them very cre creatively with GW for gravitational wave, and then 15 for the year, 09 the month, and then the day that, they, that it was uh, recorded. Um, but perhaps more interesting even than, um, or different than the, this black hole system, is the merger of two neutron stars, which we saw actually quite recently. Neutron stars are the dead cores of long gone stars that eventually also crash just like, the, just like the black holes we've been talking about. But being made of matter, they don't only emit gravitational waves, they also emit a whole plethora of electromagnetic emission across, across the spectrum. So um, radio waves, visible light, gamma rays, X-rays, you name it. And so this delivers an, an invaluable worth, uh, wealth of astrophysical information and also about the nuclear matter that, that makes up these objects. So you can see already from all the stuff I've told you about that there's a lot of science going on here. And you can learn about the evolution of stars, about the history of galaxy evolution, clusters, even the history of the universe itself by doing cosmology with gravitational wave signals. This Gravitational waves have opened a whole new way of doing astronomy and physics. And we have s different teams, so there's different communities that, focuses, that focus on different aspects of um, this, the, all the science that we can do with this new information. But to me, perhaps the most exciting prospect is to use gravitational waves to learn about the nature of gravity itself. Gravitational waves provide a unique window into the nature of space and time because they are they are a manifestation of the fundamental geometry of how space and time are, and are woven together. Um, I'm not the only one that finds this stuff uh, the most interesting. The public tends to love this kind of stuff. And so then that leads to like very well-intentioned but awful, awfully <laughs> executed uh, um, covers like this. The theory of relativity proved. This came out when we saw, uh, announced our first detection. We can't prove theories in science. You don't need to be Karl Popper to know that. We can only try to disprove theories, but nonetheless, uh, we do try to learn more about fundamental physics from our observations. And we do that by comparing the predictions of Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity, which has been exquisitely tested on many domains, but not necessarily gravitational waves. And we try to look at those predictions and look at our data and try to see if there is something new there. Is there a mismatch? Is there something that could point us to beyond Einstein physics? There are multiple ways to do this. You can compute precise waveforms, precise uh, predictions for the structure of the signal that we should see and compare and see if there's any uh, small deviation from that. Or you can look at fundamental properties of the wave, more basic things like their speed or what I will tell you about, which is the gravitational wave polarizations. Um, this is all totally biased. This is my interest, but I'm giving the talk, so today you'll hear about how to learn about <laughs> gravitational waves polarizations. There are other many interesting things you could, you could do with, about fundamental physics with gravitational waves, but let's focus on this. Why? Because polarizations are a direct manifestation of the, the, the wave that, um, of, the, of the fundamental geometry of space and time. And so to try to understand what this means, let us start with a light warm-up, thinking about electromagnetic waves. So light is a wave in, an, in the electric field. The electric field is a vector, so you can think of light as some arrow that oscillates up and down as the wave comes by. Um, you, there are several ways in which a vector can oscillate. So one way is like vertically, like here, or it can do so horizontally. And these two different modes constitute what we call linear polarizations of the electromagnetic wave, linear polarizations of light. If you have polarized sunglasses, the way, it works is by, the way they work is by taking advantage of this fact and filtering out vertically uh, or horizontally uh, polarized light. Any kind of wave you can decompose into, um, verti into vertically or horizontally polarized uh, modes, even if it's something like a, circular, um, a circularly polarized um, electromagnetic wave. And so because light is a vector the, and it has these two polarizations, at any given point of the, um, 
as the, as the wave is propagating at any given point in the electromagnetic field, you can restore the state if you look, if you rotate everything by 360 degrees. So if you look down as the wave propagates to, towards you, as light propagates towards you at any given instant, the, vec the vector of the electric field would point in some direction. And if you freeze it and if you rotate it by 360 degrees, everything looks the same. So we say that these kinds of waves have spin weight one because it just means that they behave like a vector and they have this symmetry property. You could imagine that a different way, way in which light could work could be that the oscillation of the electric field happened not transversely to the direction of propagation, but longitudinally. And so in that case, if you looked into the direction of propagation, then you wouldn't see this. You wouldn't have to rotate by 360 degrees. You, you could just, any, any angle that you, could, that you rotate it by, um, it would look the same. And that would be a spin, what we call a spin zero or scalar polarization. But the laws of physics preclude that. Maxwell's equations don't allow you to do that. Um, and so in, in, in reality, light only has these two um, transverse components. But if we didn't know that Maxwell's equation said that, if we didn't know in the quantum language for those in the know that, that uh, photons have mass, we could experimentally check that and try to see if one of the, which, what is the geometry of the polarizations of light. And that is going to be what we want to do, but with gravitational waves. In the case of gravitational waves, it's a little more complicated. You don't, don't only have three options, two of which are allowed by the theory. You have six options. And so I will try to break this down for you, but they are the six options for how space and can be stretched, space can be stretched and squeezed as the gravitational wave uh, whizzes by are represented here in, um, by their effect on, on, on free-falling rings of particles like I showed earlier. So the effect that I showed you before is this one in which um, this, the gravitational wave stretches and squeezes the ring in perpendicular directions transverse to the direction of propagation. But let's start with these two. So these two modes we call scalar modes because what they do is, uh, first one, the breathing one will grab space and it will stretch it and squeeze it in, in, a, in a plane that's perpendicular to the direction of propagation, here always indicated by the arrow and it will do so symmetrically around the, around the axis, uh, then the longitudinal mode will just stretch and squeeze along the direction of propagation. So for these two modes, if you looked in from above, they will, it will look symmetric to you at any given time around the direction of propagation. So we say again that these modes have spin weight zero, that we call them scalar modes because of, the, of this symmetry. It's just a label. You could also have what we call vector modes in which the stretching and squeezing of, of space happens partially along the direction of propagation and partially along the x or y axis. And for these two modes, if you looked from, if you, again, you look down from uh, the direction of propagation, in this case, if the waves come in this way and I look uh, towards this, uh, in this direction, then what you would see is just well, you can imagine an arrow, a red arrow pointing down and a uh, green arrow pointing down. It just looks like a single arrow, just like in the case of, um, of electromagnetic waves that I showed you first. And so if you rotate it around 360 degrees around that line, you recover the state that you were in. And so this has the same symmetry as light, and we call these vector polarizations. Finally, you could have the stretching and squeezing happen only in the plane transverse to direction of propagation, and that could be, uh, and that would be at in, in, in two uh, perpendicular directions. That could be if, if they are um, like this, or they could be 45 degrees rotated from that around the, the direction of propagation, and we have these two modes which we call plus and cross. And these two uh, polarizations we call tensor polarizations because if you look down the direction of propagation, their symmetry is such that you don't have to rotate it by 360 degrees to recover what you had be, uh, originally. You only need to do so by 180 degrees. So we say they have spin weight two. So again, all these polarizations are allowed just by gener generic geometric arguments. So it's just like how, in how many different ways you can deform space um, in, in, with respect to the direction of propagation that a wave is propagating. As it turns out, GR categorically only allows these tensor modes for deep reasons having to do with what GR says the properties of, of gravity should be and of the structure of space and time. 
But there's a whole slew of theories out there that have different predictions. And you can see that which polarizations are allowed by different theories. It doesn't matter the details. It's just for you to have an idea that if you want to go beyond uh, general relativity, you usually can't avoid, or it's a very common um, feature that you will have to add some degrees of freedom in the f that will show up like extra polarizations. The message is that if you see that the gravitational waves have any, say, longitudinal component or something that's not the plus and cross polarizations that GR predicts, that's a total no-go test for GR. And it's directly pointing you to something new that we don't know about. But forget about the theories for now. What we actually want to do is to be able to measure this. And so how, how can we do this? Well, our instruments take this differential. Um, the only thing that our instruments measure is the mismatching the length between the two arms. So if a gravitational wave of some given polarization, say a plus polarization with the axis of stretching and squeezing align, aligned with the arms comes in right from above, this stretching, this differential changing length would be maximal. And so the, the interferometer will measure this gravitational wave very well. However, if it, the same wave came from a different direction, same, say with the direction aligned diagonally uh, along the diagonal of the arms, it will affect, it will stretch and squeeze the two arms at the same time so that there's no mismatch at any given moment. And so the instrument cannot, cannot measure anything. So this gravitational wave could be going by and we wouldn't see it at all. We can represent this angular dependence of the sensitivity by looking at a plot, at a plot like this, which, in which you should imagine that you place a detector at the center with the vertex at the origin, and so these are the two arms of the detector, and in any given uh, location, let's say you have a source here with, with respect to the detector, the radial coordinate will tell you how sensitive you are to a gravitational wave of this given polarization coming from that direction. So if it's over there, there's a, this arrow is very long, so it means that our response to that signal is very good, so we can measure it very well. If it came, for example, from the side instead, we don't actually have any sensitivity to that location in the sky, so that's bad. And the key point is that this angular sensitivity is very different for each polarization. So for a, a, maybe I am very sensitive to a plus polarization coming from here, but if it was a scalar polarization, I shouldn't be able to see it. And this is what is going to allow us to discriminate between uh, the different polarizations given the data that we've seen. The easiest way that you could imagine doing this is if you had a, a s continuous signal coming from a given location in the sky. If, if you had that, so let's say it's just a monotone, like boo, and then it's just, you know it's coming from there in the sky. As the Earth rotates, the instrument will move with respect to this, the, source, uh, the source location, that point in the sky. And so, as seen from the detector, the, actually the, the source is moving with respect to the detector in the detector frame. And so, the sensitivity to that source will go up and down as the source, uh, as that point in the sky traces an arc uh, around as the Earth uh, spins on its axis. And so, you see this, would this, the arrow here would represent the sensitivity to a given point in the sky as the Earth is rotating. So to the detector, it looks like the source is moving. And so your, your sensitivity goes up and down as the Earth comes in and out of the most sensitive regions uh, for you. And this would be totally different for the different polarizations. And so your, the way this would manifest itself in your data is that you would see a signal that if intrinsically has the same amplitude, but you record it in, uh, with growing and, in, and, and decreasing amplitude depending on the polarization it has. So there's an intrinsic amplitude modulation associated to any polarization at any given point in the sky. And this is what I'm showing you as an example for a given uh, point in the sky, uh, for a, a given detector, you can, you can pr predict how your sensitivity should evolve as a function of time with a period of a day. So it, it will repeat itself once the Earth comes back to, to where it was. So these are what we call continuous signals. They're a subset of, I guess, persistent signals, which would also include stochastic backgrounds, which I won't discuss um, in this talk, but they are sort of like the cosmic microwave background, but in gravitational waves for, 
those of you who know. But the point is that if you have a signal that lasts very long, this amplitude, this characteristic amplitude will, um, pattern will get imprinted on the signal and it will be a key feature that will allow us to tell which polarization the, the signal has. Luckily for us, there are, we know that there should be sources that exactly give us something just like what I described before, a monotone from a given particular sky location. This is because, oh. Little water. Ooh. All right, let's skip that. This is because when a star dies, um, it will, as I mentioned before, if it has exactly the right mass, its core will contract, and if it's not too heavy, it will not form a black hole, it will instead form a, nu uh, a neutron star. And that's what I wanted to show you, but okay. Um, <laughs> let's not do that. Um, the neutron star is almost, it has the, around the, a couple times the mass of the sun in the size of Pasadena. And it's almost a perfect sphere, but it's possible that it has a slight asymmetry, a small mountain that might be even a centimeter high or something small like that. And it's spinning so rapidly that even such a small asymmetry would create, it, it would be enough uh, a source of gravitational waves that are strong enough that we may be able to see. And because this is not, um, it's almost not slowing down, it's slowing down a little bit, um, but the, because of that, the frequency of the gravitational wave will be almost precisely uh, constant. And we know exactly where the source is because we can see this neutron star spinning in the sky and we can target our searches and see if there's a signal, uh, a, a gravitational wave signal coming from these uh, asymmetric neutron stars. Um, the, the cool part is that you have to also know the, the, the way we search for these signals, we assume that we know the polarization that the s signal has. So we assume that Einstein is correct, and we say, well, given the source and sky location, we should see this sort of signal in the data, and we try and look for that. So if you assume the wrong sky location, um, oh, let me show you the animation that I have. Yeah. How does that work? Okay. Um, yeah. If we assume the wrong sky location, uh, sorry, the wrong polarization, then um, you would actually not see the signal. So what we did is we went back to the data and we said, well, maybe Einstein has been wrong this whole time and the polarization of these signals is not like he predicted. It's not the transverse plus and cross signals, but it's something, uh, polarizations, but it's something different, in which case there could be a very loud continuous wave from one of these pulses that we know exists, but it would be hiding in the data because we assumed the wrong polarization. We didn't find any signals or you, we would have won another Nobel Prize by now and you would have heard about it. But we still were able to place the first upper limits for this non-tensorial, uh, non non-GR emission from 200 pulsars that we know are there. And so we try to make sure that there are any uh, continuous wave signals of any polarization. It could be vector. And so what you're seeing in this plot is the maximum amplitude that a signal from any given pulsar indicated by a dot, uh, the maximum amplitude there it could have so that it's still hiding under the data and we didn't see it and under the noise and we didn't see it. And this is the, the gravitational wave frequency of the signal we expect for each of the pulsars. This is one famous pulsar, which the movie was about, but it didn't cooperate, uh, the crab pulsar, which we target among all of these. So we have the first vector upper limits. So the first limits of how much non-GR signals these pulsars could be emitting and also the first scalar upper limits uh, as well. But anyways, this will be a great resource once we actually detect one of these signals because we'll be able to, even with one detector, measure and tell, say exactly what the polarization of the signal is, even to a very precise level. But how about the signals we have seen? These are very, very different, actually. They're not long, they're very short, and so we can't actually do this, um, we can't play with the rotation of the Earth and, and try to see the amplitude modulation and try to identify the polarizations that way because these signals last a maximum some seconds, whereas we need something that lasts at least a whole day to see the, the modulation, as I explained. Uh, but instead, what we can do is if you have several detectors around the Earth and you have a gravitational wave of some given polarization that's coming in from what, some sky location, it will go through the earth and it will interact with the different detectors and it will ring them up differently just because the relative orientations is different. So some of the detectors will respond more or less than the others just depending on how they were oriented with respect to the gravitational wave and how, uh, 
and what the polarization of the wave it was, so what the geometry of the wave itself was. So we can grab these relative amplitudes and delays between the signals at different detectors, and we can try to reconstruct both the sky location, so where the signal came from. This is sort of what you do with microphones. Microphones can't really say where a sound signal is coming from. You have to use at least three microphones to triangulate where a given sound uh, is originating. Same with your ears, the way you know where someone, someone calls your name, the way you know where it is is by actually ch changing, shaking your head a little bit and noticing the difference between your two ears. Your brain does that for you. And so our instruments work sort of the same way. You have to triangulate to reconstruct where the signal is coming from. And there is also in there the polarization of the wave. So if you want to know with certainty where the signal came from, you would also need to include some assumption about what the geometry of the wave is. Um, so the relative amplitudes and phases and the time delays between the signals at different detectors can tell you where the signal is coming from and uh, what polarization content it has. This is for our first signal. So this is this orange area marks where we think is the most likely uh, region in the sky that the source was located at. Uh, and that was obtained, we only had two detectors, so that, and that was obtained assuming the uh, polarizations were just as Einstein predicted. If you had assumed that they were totally not like Einstein predicted, so instead of being tensor modes, they were vector modes, uh, you would still, it would still work, the analysis would still work, but you would infer a different sky location for the source. And we, so there are some degeneracies here between the different polarizations and the sky location of the source and the different uh, relative amplitude phases and delays that they would produce in a network. So ideally, we would need five detectors at least to try to break these degeneracies and disentangle the full polarization content of a given signal as we see it. It's five polarizations because um, we, I started with six, but actually the two scalar modes are indistinguishable to us, so there's actually five dis modes, that we, five polarizations that we can distinguish, and so those five, are, those five are known, so you need at least five detectors to uniquely determine what the polarization content of a signal uh, um, was. Um, but if you don't have five detectors, let's say you have three, um, in that case you can start to make some partial statements about what the polarization content of the signal should be. And so we do have three detectors, luckily. Um, that's why I said that. Um, <laughs> we have the two LIGO detectors and the, our sister experiment in Italy, Virgo, which is a very similar, um, also an interferometer. It has three kilometer long arms instead of four kilometer long arms, but we all work together. And so if you see a signal with three interferometers, you can start to discard some models. So for example, for our first detection, it could have been that that signal we saw was produced by a fully non-GR polarization wave. But with Virgo, uh, now we were able to use one of the later black holes that we saw. This one was the first one that we saw with three detectors. So, so it happened in August 14 of uh, last year. Um, you can actually try to see whether some of the hypotheses are disfavored. And if you look at the data, you will find that in this case, the GR prediction that the polarization should be transverse plus and cross like Einstein predicted is a 300 times more likely than it, than it being vectored with the longitudinal um, mo uh, geometry that I, I showed you earlier. And if you do that for com to compare tensor versus scalar, we, you find it's a thousand times more likely. What this means is that the data, it's hard to explain the data as well if you want it to be so, uh, a longitudinal wave of some, it has some weird geometry, totally different from what Einstein predicted. And this was really the first handle that we got experimentally on, gravi on gravitational wave polarizations. As measured here at Earth, just without assuming anything really about, or almost anything about the source, and trying to measure from the geometry of our instruments, infer what the geometry of the polarizations of the wave were. Because there is a degeneracy, there's some degeneracy between polarizations and sky location, if you're paying attention, you should be wondering what can we uh, do or can we say using the, the data from uh, our binary neutron star detection? Because in that case, we saw exactly where it happened. So we know where it came from a priori. Uh, and so we should be able to do much better at uh, 
telling what the polarizations of the wave were. I'm not allowed uh, to say anything about this yet because it hasn't been published and if I do, some LIGO sniper will, will kill me. <laughs> um, but because I know you're dying to know, I can tell you what you should expect. And what you should expect is that we indeed do very well. And I'll show you why. So um, we can grab those uh, 3D plots that I showed you earlier for the sensitivity of a given detector for a given angle and polarization, and we can make it into a heat map. So in this case, each of these plots, for example, this one tells me that Livingston should be very sensitive to tensor signals coming from this location in the sky, but not so sensitive from locations from signals coming from this location in the sky. Um, and so there's a characteristic pattern for each instrument and each polarization. And so, for example, we know that the binary neutron star happened in this location in the, star, in the, in the sky. And so we should expect that the Hanford detector should have seen it very, very strongly, very well. So it should have recorded the signal without problem. So uh, same thing for Livingston, the two LIGO detectors. So they should have responded a lot to this, this signal. But the Virgo detector, the Italian detector, shouldn't have seen much if this was, like a, if, if this was indeed a tensor uh, wave like Einstein predicted. If this wasn't uh, a, a tensor wave, if it was a vector wave, for example, the story changes and you shouldn't, have, you shouldn't see too much power in Hanford, you should see some power in Livingston and a lot of power in, in, in Virgo. So you can look at the data and see if you actually saw the signal very strongly here, in Virgo, then you can say that doesn't agree with what Einstein said should happen. Um, so, and that's a similar story for scalar as well. So this is the, the way we can start to distinguishing between these hypotheses. So stay tuned for, <laughs> for these numbers. Anyways, so with the recent detections uh, uh, of gravitational waves with our three detectors, we have for the first time learned about gravitational wave uh, polarization geometry directly. And we found that, um, as expected, um, the, uh, the models that, I, that agree with Einstein's predictions are, are favored from those that deviate from it. Um, this is not a surprise. We expected this. But nonetheless, we hadn't actually been able to check that, not with two detectors. Um, in the future, there's many more things we would like to do, like try to check if this signal is, for example, it's mostly like Einstein predicted, but has a small uh, component that's a non-GR um, contribution to its signal. That's not something we can do right now because we don't have enough detectors to actually break all these uh, degeneracies. Alternatively, if we detected a continuous wave signal, we would be able to do that as well and try to distinguish whether combinations of polarizations better. And that's very interesting to theorists. But nonetheless, this was the first baby step into measuring this new fundamental property that tells us about the structure of space and time pretty much directly. Um, so there's a lot of science that can be done. As I told you, I just mentioned the very small, narrow area that I'm most interested in and that I've worked on uh, the most. But there's a lot more, and I encourage you to go out there and learn about it. Uh, currently, our, our detectors are down for improvements, and I think they will be up in December if that's uh, correct for a third observation run of the advanced detectors. And our range would be much, much higher. So it means we'll be able to see signals further away. Uh, and so even though all of this stuff, which I've told you about, which is sounds spectacular to you because it's totally new, it's a totally new way of doing astronomy and doing basic physics, uh, as impressive as it might sound, it will soon be dwarfed by all the new information that we gained uh, from the universe using gravitational uh, or advanced gravitational wave detectors. So uh, um, it's a very exciting time uh, to be involved in, in gravitational waves. So I'm very lucky. And I look forward to what the future comes, uh, brings. Thank you.
I believe the maximum mass for a neutron star from standard physics should be around three solar masses, or so that, like very extreme. Um, there's no minimum mass for a black hole in standard physics, uh, if, but to do that, you would have to do quantum gravity stuff like I would, <laughs> like I used to do. And from quantum effects, you might get a minimum mass of sort of the, maybe the Planck mass, if you know what that is. But um, in classical theories, there's no, no limit. There was another question, do you? Yeah, you mentioned about the point about the frequency of gravitational waves. So in terms of electromagnetic waves, there is like interrelation between energy of the photon and then frequency. And in terms of gravitational waves, is there an internal, like first how you think about the frequency of gravitational waves and is there an interrelation between energy of simple graviton versus yeah, same same relationship. I mean, this is all classical, right? So it doesn't. We don't are not seeing individual gravitons. Uh, we're seeing large amounts of coherent um, gravitational waves. So it's a classical thing. You can compute how many gravitons are associated with these waves that we have seen um, by using that formula you just mentioned. Yeah, same thing. It's well, we don't know that. If you just ex it's just if you just expand. Uh, if you do a naive treatment of quantum gravity in the semi-classical limit, it should give you something like that. Yeah, or I don't really see you. But can you say anything about the medium through which the waves propagate? Yeah, there isn't one. It's um, it's well, it's this it's this space space time itself, and if you describe it in terms of uh, gravita of curvature of space and time. The space-time itself, or space, if you just want to think about space, is endowed with the degrees of freedom, if you wish, in a sense, which carry this gravitational wave. If you want to just think about it classically, it would be the gravitational field. So this is like a wave in the, electro in the gravitational field instead of the electromagnetic, yeah? Sorry, that's not what I meant. What I meant was, um, is the wave getting distorted as ah. to That was a better question, okay. <laughs> Yeah, very, very, very weakly. You can compute that the, the interaction with matter, it's very, very small. And so t for all intents and purposes, this is just geometrical optics for the waves. Um, and that's the reason why it's so hard, they're so hard to detect as well, right? Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, th that's a statement about Bayesian odds. So we can look at the data. We have some priors. We have, we can do math and integrate, and we get an evidence. So it's the probability that these data were produced, assuming they were either it was either a tensor wave or a vector wave or whatever. And then you can compare the two, and you'll find those numbers. You find that one is 300 lar times larger than the other, or a thousand times t uh, larger than the other. So these are odds in a Bayesian sense. If you change your priors, it would slightly change. But in this case, um, this preference doesn't come only from the priors. I don't think this is detailed in our papers, but I can tell you that if you just looked at the how the waveforms match, so just a an RMS a goodness of fit measure, you would also find that the maximum likelihood estimator ben favors GR over the others. So it's not, it's not dominated by a priors. Good question.